hours of localization. Now we move to brains, deep brains, and derived. So it's a pleasure to have Rosenblum, who will tell us about deep brains from a derived point of view. So your place is all there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's actually uh, my first time in Italy, besides the pleasure on many other levels as well. Uh, so, just before coming here, I was actually at the uh, uh, Gelfand Centennial Conference that they had at MIT. And one of the uh, one of the more interesting parts of it was, you know, all, all, a bunch of, all of his former, a lot of his former students and some other people who interacted with him uh, provided some reminiscences of, of what what it was like to interact with him. And I was particularly struck by one story uh, comparing the mathematics of Gelfand and Grothendieck. So Gelfand is famous for uh, being very, very concrete, really liking explicit formulas for everything, and uh, trying to avoid formalism as much as possible, abstract formalism. Grothendieck, of course, was the opposite. And uh, they have never, they have never met. Uh, but despite that, uh, there were a lot of similarities in their lives. Both of them developed their love for mathematics uh, at a young age when they were living in quite a bit of isolation. Uh, and both, at the, at the time, were fascinated by the problem of integration. So, uh, Grothendieck was interested, and he, did, he, you know, he didn't care about computing any integrals or anything like that. He just wanted to know, what is this thing that's the integral, much like him to reinvent the Lebesgue measure. Uh, and Gelfand, uh, he was just interested in calculating volumes of things. He wanted to know, he didn't care what, what it was really, what it really meant to integrate, but you know, he wanted to take a concrete object and calculate uh, its volume. And yet, so, so, so this was the context in which both of them developed their views uh, on math, and they would both, both of them uh, frequently cited Riemann's letter to his father as what they feel mathematics should be about. And so, when asked about why, why they share the same source, despite the fact that their uh, work is obviously so different, uh, Gelfand replied that, well, I think, I think really we, we view mathematics exactly the same way, except for some insignificant details. <laughs> um, and I think fundamentally he was right, in that uh, good formalism informs good formulas, and vice versa. So, I tell you this, uh, because I think there's a bit of a, there's going to be a bit of a gap in abstraction, uh, an increase of abstraction in my lectures. Uh, but for those of you who are less abstract minded, that maybe uh, it's, a, it's important to understand that these things really do uh, co have implications for very concrete things. So, well, let's begin. So the, so I'm supposed to talk about derived categories. It's a subject that's uh, famous for being uh, very uh, arcane and boring. So in order to try to ease, uh, ease the price of turn, uh, admission, I wanted to start, with, uh, to start at the end and provide some motivation, maybe geometric and physical, for one, one might, why, why one might care. It's a bit of a revisionist history, so I apologize for that, but bear with me. Um, so I wanted to start with kind of the idea of Siegel. Um, maybe extended. Idea Siegel uh, topological quantum field theories. So uh, this is really a variant of their definition. Uh, so, so what it says is that it gives a, well, sort of a, uh, an abstract interpretation of what the Feynman integral is in the case of topological field theory. So what, what they say is, well, so n is the dimension, is that there's this category, word n. So, so I apologize. Oh, really, this is an n category. Never mind what that means, but it's a, some kind of a category. So, I hope everyone is familiar with what a category is. Otherwise, this is really not going to go well. So, so, so the objects 
our zero dimensional manifolds. Our morphisms, or I should say the one morphisms, are cobordisms of zero dimensional manifolds. So, so, so 
you know it's not for what do you know? You no, know. so so yeah. So topological quantum field theory is a bunker from from Bordet to some other category. Uh, and so objects correspond to objects. So you have some target category, and you're supposed to specify an object uh, which is the image. So once you know what corresponds to the point, once you have a list of objects you may receive. Well there's only one object that corresponds to the point. Right. This point is a single object right. of this. So just that one single object right. determines everything. So that's not entirely true. There's some symmetries of this object that you also have to specify, depending on, uh, say I was a little bit vague about what I meant by manifold. Uh, so the thing you said would be strictly speaking for frame manifolds. Of course, it's more uh, usual to consider oriented manifolds. And then there's an additional symmetries that this object satisfies. But it's nothing more, but it's some data on the value uh, of the field theory at the point. And that automatically implies for everything else. So it's a kind of a uh, very, it's a very deep result relating geometry and algebra, I would say. So the example I wanted to talk about is the B model. So I don't at all want to dwell on this formalism, but I just want to give an example uh, and see what kind of consequences it has for this example. So in the B model, in, in, in this kind of form, this kind of formulation for the B model, uh, we start with a Calabriel with a compact OABL uh, So such a thing is automatically an uh, algebraic variety that's part of the OABL structure. Sheaves on one. 
So this is a well, this is this is going to be some this is a category. This is going to be some vector space, or more generally, a complex of vector spaces. Oh, but now, so 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 we're up to one here, and uh, well, one thing to observe is that is that so this this is by the way in 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 board two this is a map from empty to empty. That's clear. So S one has some symmetries. Namely, there's a, there's a, it has a non-trivial diffeomorphism. So the, so the upshot, so have an action of the diffeomorphism group of S1 on this optional homology of Y. So now, now we're getting something uh, pretty non-trivial. So we started with an algebraic variety. Uh, we associated to it. We, uh, so the thing that I want to emphasize is that this is some purely algebraic and formal construction. And now we've got an action on this of the diffeomorphic group of the circle. So one of the questions uh, that I want to answer is what is this action? Uh, so even more importantly, perhaps, uh, what does it mean to have such an action? This is a this is a chain complex, and this is a topological group. What does it mean for for such a thing to act on this? I realize nobody can read this, but it says, "What does it mean to have such an action?" Just, just a question. Yeah. When you say partial homology, I guess you don't mean partial homology, but rather the complex of the homology. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was. Even, well, you're absolutely right, but uh, so far I was vague about it. But that is really what I mean, and we'll see that. So, so, so what I hope to get to in these lectures is, uh, is well, to answer all these questions and to describe some consequences of this. There are some, there's some pretty, uh, I think, remarkable consequences uh, of these predictions from uh, physics to towards geometry. So the, uh, kind of the most interesting aspects, so, so, the, so the key questions, is how does the geometry of one um, correspond to structure so this is kind of a key question that I want to get to is how to pass between geometric questions on y and purely algebraic Questions on the category quasi coherent sheets. Uh, so, this kind of passage from the, from the category to its derived category is, in some sense, a, uh, a kind of linearization. And so, I guess from that point of view, uh, we're doing things very backwards because I'm first introducing to you derived categories, which is, which is the quantum thing, and without telling you what the classical thing is. But I think that will. Uh, We'll see some of that uh, probably in Duncan's lectures. So, anyhow, so 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 this is where we're going. So so this is going to be our main object of study, and uh, the thing that I wanted to do today is to talk about this first word, maybe this first two words, of what derived category is. So. So okay, so really it's a uh, slightly souped up version of homological algebra. So if you're used to doing homological algebra, it's just a formalism. Uh, it, we're just going to have a formalism which gives a systematic way of talking about the kind of computations that you do.
So, and again, you'll see that I'm abusing language here, so up here, and I mean by the right category something more refined than what people have traditionally meant by it. But by the way, while well, well, on the subject, I. As a, as a philosophical point, I'd like to uh, remark that I really don't like this term derived category because uh, it suggests that the, that the thing you're starting with is, is the basic object and the derived category is well derived from it. Uh, whereas I think, I think really one should uh, think of these things the other way around as the derived category being the fundamental object. But anyway, we'll see. So, and the idea is we want a formalism for studying homology. Uh, so on the one hand, we have, uh, let's say, vector spaces. On the other hand, we can, we can consider x and <laughs> forward between. And those don't seem to fit in any in, in the same framework where we consider linear in the usual linear algebra framework. So I e extend linear algebra. Encompass. That's and force. Um, so, 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 so the way to do that is not to talk about cohomology directly, but to consider chain complexes. So, not, so we don't want just we don't want to just identify chain complexes which have the same homology. Uh, we want to we want to we want to have an identification for every map which induces an isomorphism of homology. And this is not quite the same thing. So, as a warning, here's an example. Uh, so if you uh, so. If, so you can consider the following complexes. So take kx1 to complement that. And the differential is given by, on the first step, for the first component, you multiply by x. For the second component, you multiply by y. And add them together. Um, 
<laughs> oh, on the other hand, just take that one copy of the polynomial ring in two variables and map it by zero to just k. So these have the same homology, and isomorphic homologies. Oh, but are not isomorphic. Sorry, just because the stupid physics system and can you explicitly say what you're doing in the first case? So in the first case, so so you have you have a polynomial of x. So here a point is a polynomial of x and y, uh, and another polynomial of x and y. Okay. Right? Two copies. Right. Uh, and what you map this to is x times p of x1 plus y times q of x1. And then if you do it twice, then it's zero. There's no twice. The next oh, one right. is zero. Okay. So it's a two-term complex. Right. Okay. There's no condition on the differential. Yeah. Um, so if you compute the cohomology of uh, this complex, you'll see that it will be this. Uh, but I claim these are not quasi-isomorphic. Well, this is a good exercise to do, and I'll leave it as an exercise. <coughs> So there is a real difference between uh, between saying that the cohomologies are isomorphic and that they're quasi-isomorphic. So that's kind of one, one difference, but maybe this is not the most significant point. But uh, the other uh, the other idea, which I hope to explicate but I'll state a little bit vaguely for now, is that, well, you can have two, two complexes which can be quasi-isomorphic in unrelated ways. There could be two different ways that the same two complexes are quasi-isomorphic. And it's important, uh, for, for, for various reasons, it's important to keep track of all that data, to, 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 to really know um, if you have two quasi-isomorphisms, are they the same in some sense? Uh, so, well, I guess, uh, I guess even before that, so we only care about chain complexes up to quasi-isomorphism and maps between them. We only, also only care about, uh, there's an equivalence relation on the maps, which is chain homotopy. We only really care about maps up to chain homotopy. Uh, so, a very good question to ask is what do, complexes of the quasi isomorphism form. What sort of thing is this collection of chain complexes of the quasi isomorphism? So the first answer is well, these form a category. And indeed, you can build a category uh, with such object and morphisms. Uh, but as it turns out, you, by doing this, you've lost, uh, you've lost far too much uh, information, uh, or at least in many cases. There's a lot you can do with this, but for, uh, I guess, more modern applications, this is far from sufficient. Um, so the second. And an improved answer is an infinity category. So, oh boy. Well, so the theory of infinity categories is a fast one, but let me just give you some idea of what sort of thing is an infinity category and how you would work with it. And, well, as we'll see some kind of concrete ways of dealing with that. So first, let me uh, briefly uh, say a few words about what sort of thing is an infinity category, and then we'll see why how chain complexes fit into the story. So an infinity category. Oh, 
it's got uh, isomorphisms. But morphisms are, maybe I should say, paths of little morphisms. So, 
just so, uh, just to get a little better impression for the thing, I want to say something about what a functor between and uh, So you know, so you have a, uh, so you have one morphism that you can, you can compose them, and so on. I mean, just you can just think about topological categories, but a functor. Sort of in this kind of rough language, it's the, it's the following data. A map. So it's a map on objects. In other words, to every object of C, you have to assign uh, an object of D. A map on morphisms. So really at all levels. Uh, you have to assign to every one morphism of C, you assign to one morphism of D, D, and so on. But so so far nothing interesting. But I want to say something about how how this behaves with respect to composition. Plus, what I'll call homotopy coherent composition. So. Rather than giving a definition, I'll give an example, which hopefully uh, captures some of the idea. So suppose we have suppose we have three composable maps in C. Uh, let's call them alpha, beta, and gamma. So what we're uh, what's, so we're supposed to be given an isomorphism between f of beta star alpha together with alpha beta sir alpha alpha as well as an isomorphism of between alpha gamma sir beta <coughs> and an ice and uh, alpha gamma beta okay so so that's for composition, but what happens with these three things? So what this gives is two isomorphisms. From so you can either compose uh, Either compose uh, beta and alpha with gamma, or you can compose gamma and beta with alpha. And this gives you two different because so far there's no relationship between these two isomorphisms. So this gives you two different isomorphisms, and the coherence in this case is an isomorphism between these. Two isomorphisms. Wait, sorry, we just lost. Uh, so, what is capital F? What is so capital F is the functor. Oh, but in your concrete examples, so you have x, y, z. So these are so x, y, z, and w are objects of C. Alpha, beta, and gamma are maps and are one more to C. Uh, you know, from x to y. Well, yeah, but yes. can, you, can you say the same <laughs> words in some concrete example? Or just to oh, make even better. Oh. Do you have a? You're supposed to assume that this is yeah, I mean, I don't want to make it That's fine. That's uh, so. I mean, I'm not sure. Would you like me to give you a concrete example of a category? Or no, category is okay, you know. But but you know, I'm trying to visualize infinity category. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't so, know some simple intuitive. Oh, 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 of an infinite category? category. Huh? Think Just think of any topological category. Uh, so for instance, the category of CW complexes is a perfectly fine example. It's sort of, it's in some sense universal. Um, so, so imagine, so, yeah, so very good. So imagine X, Y, Z, and W are topological spaces. Okay. And these are maps. Uh, and, and as part of the data of a functor, so suppose C is spaces. 
uh, as part, part of a data for each topological space, you're supposed to associate an object of the target category. For every map of topological spaces, you're supposed to specify a map in the target category. And for every two composable maps, you don't, you don't enforce equality, but you specify, you give the data of an isomorphism between the, the image of the composite, that's, uh, that's, you've already given that, and the composite of the images. You can do that because the target is also a category. So this is what this isomorphism is, and this is this isomorphism. So this is this isomorphism for this composite. This is this isomorphism for this composite. But now you can. But now there's an associativity question in composition. You can first compose these and then with this, or you can first compose these and compose that with this. And a priori, you get two different answers. Uh, and so part of the coherence is identifying. So what would be an interesting example of the target category D if uh, C is a category of topology? Oh, oh, I don't know. You can also take topological spaces. What? <laughs> you can also take topological spaces. Is there anything here? Uh, that, I mean, so, I mean, take your favorite functor from topological spaces to topological spaces. So say, uh, uh, well, and we're, well, so, so if, you, if you think of categories as topological categories, any ordinary functor of topological categories will, in particular, give you such a um, so the point is, uh, but the point is, uh, and it's mostly an equivalent, and, and you can mostly always do that, uh, but it's not such a good idea to think in those terms. Maybe, maybe you can say that, for example, if you take a monoidal category, yeah. it would produce something which looks like an infinity category with only one object, mm -hmm. then think the object of your monoidal category has one morphisms, and the morphisms of your monoidal category has two morphisms. And if you, if you write the usual coherence action axiom for monoidal factors, you'll find something which almost looks yeah. like this. So uh, yeah, so, so maybe to so maybe to amplify what you said, if you if you so monoidal category for so example, it's a category of vector spaces, right? Yeah, well Let's be try to give you an example in a slightly different context. So what this kind of thing should remind you of, if you're familiar with this, is A infinity structure. Right. Um, and so, so an example, uh, not of this, but of, a, of what happens with the infinity structures, and it's completely analogous, uh, is suppose we have a topological space, based topological space, we can consider the base loop space. Uh, and maybe let's do the same. Let's maybe have a y and a loops y. So, so the analogous question, and in fact this is a special case, is what are is a loop space? So maybe you want to study a loop space maps from x to y, from loops x to loops y. So a priori, you know what the answer is supposed to be. It's just supposed to be, suppose, if these are connected, these are supposed to be just maps from x to y, the same as maps from x to y. This is what loop space theory tells you. Oh, but those are not the same, of course, as homotopy classes of maps from loops x to loops y, because there's additional structure. And the additional structure is an A infinity structure. Oh, and it's exactly this sort of thing. So loops have a composition that's only well defined up to homotopy. So, oh, by the way, I want to. So I was vague about the models, but I want to take the most naive version of the loop space, one that does not have a strictly associative multiplication. So there is still, or or maybe or maybe let's take one that does. Maps well, don't necessarily need to respect that. Is the point? Yeah, I think Vance already used in his talk something very, very similar to topological spaces to the chain complexes computing singular homology, for example. Um, yeah, so, well, it's a little it's very, difficult very to give an example in that context because those are awfully nice chain complexes. So it's hard to see these kinds of uh, features there. But, uh, but if you, but, but here's a more algebraic example, just to get ahead of myself a little bit, which is if you're familiar with the theory of uh, 
uh, differential graded algebras. If you have two differential graded algebras, you can ask, what is the right notion of maps between them? Uh, well, so if they're nice, it's just strip maps respecting all the structure. But in general, it's, but in general, that's not all the maps that are reasonable to consider. And all the maps that are reasonable to consider are the A infinity maps between, between them, which is sometimes a larger class of things. So it's, 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 it's that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't know, does that? Yeah, no, it helps, but I think examples help from it. Yeah, I mean, because when you say too many words with infinity attached, it just gets lost. That's right. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, to get reasonable examples, I think I need to say more words first. Yeah. But then they are lost. Uh, well, so let me, let me say more words, and then I'll give the example, and then we can go back and uh, try to revisit some of these words. I think that's a... So, okay, so one... So what sort of... So, so what's... So, so, the, so the main... Uh, so, so kind of the main thing to think about the infinity category is that uh, pretty much all the formal uh, constructions and theorems that you have in ordinary category theory remain true in this context. All formal theorems uh, and constructions In ordinary categories, or in infinity categories. So that's not that's a very vague statement. So let me give you an example. So the the most important construction I know in category theory is that of limits and collisions. So, an example. So, limits and co limits. Uh, so, these are in the infinity world. Well, so I'll call them limits and co limits, but they produce uh, homotopy limits and homotopy co limits. So, well, there, let me just talk about one. Let's pick one. Let's say co limits. You will teach us. There's no real loss of generality of talking about one of them. So if you have a diagram, say, again, let's think in topological spaces. You have some diagram in topological spaces. Well, what would be a colimit? In the ordinary category, it would be a universal space that everything maps to. Whereas uh, in, uh, in, in, for the infinity category, it would also be the universal space that everything maps to, but now up to homotopy. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that to specify a map from this homotopy colimit to something means to specify, means, well, gosh, I just erased what I wanted to be on the board. It means you have to specify a, a map from every object in the diagram to your object. For every map, you have to specify an isomorphism now between the composite map to the object and the map uh, from the thing, and similarly for compositions and so on. So, it's a bit abstract, so let me uh, consider the simplest example. The simplest example of a colimit is a push out. So suppose, so we're working in spaces. So our infinity category is the thing that corresponds to the topological category of CW complexes. Uh, and let me take the simplest push out that I can think of. So x mapping to point, point is the terminal object. Should I call this y? Is it confusing to have x on star? Or is that OK? All right. So suppose we have this diagram, and we want to compute the push out. So if we were just working in a regular category theory, well, the push out would be, well, it's a map from point to something, and a map from point to this thing. And so as long as a 
and because uh, and, and the, the composites from x to the thing would have to be uh, would have to be equal, uh, which means that as long as x is non-empty, this would just be a point. Uh, on the other hand, what does it mean to specify a, 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 in the infinity categorical sense a pushing? Well, so it's got to be some so. Well, let's say what it means to map to some to an object y. So you're supposed to give a map from the point to y, another map from a point to y, and now the restrictions to x, you have two maps from x to y, now both of which factor through a point. So this is just a point in y, and this is another point in y. Uh, and uh, you know what, let me, let me even simplify. Let's take the example of x to be, uh, say, well, we go. well let, me, let, me, let, me, let me be a little bit more precise. Let me work not in spaces, sorry for the change, but in, but in based spaces. A little nicer answer. So, uh, so, so what do we have here? So the point here has to map to the base point of y. This point has to map to the base point of y, right? Because these are base maps. And now the restriction, so this is two points. The restriction, one of them is the base point and one of them is not. So the restriction here, uh, so the base point has to map to base point and there's nothing to say. But there's another point which both restrictions map to the base point. But now we're supposed to specify an isomorphism. And just because they map to the same point, uh, sorry, homotopy between these maps. Now, just because they map to the same point already doesn't mean that we can't specify a different homotopy. So, such a map is exactly going to be a loop in Y uh, from, from the base point to itself. So, this homotopy question is going to be the base space, which is the circle. So, that maps from here to Y are the same thing as loops in Y at that base point. Uh, so hopefully that uh, clarifies something. Is that a question? Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? This is sort of the fundamental example of the, of the kind of thing that... Should I, should I think here that X is a category? What's a, no, 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 this is just a space. This is just, this is just, so our category, so, sorry, so the category, so C is, uh, uh, is based spaces. So take the topological category of based CW complexes. So this, this is a topological category. And as I said, you can think of one of these as an infinity category. And I have a diagram in this infinity category that looks like this. Uh, and I said before that, for instance, colonies make sense in this world. And so I was just computing what the colimit is in, in that infinity. So these arrows are one more fitting solution. Yeah, the arrows are one more fitting solution. Maybe another example which is connected to the, the, the other lecture is if you have group acting on points, yeah. if you take the, the, the naive, the, the usual portion in the category of space, you, you'll get the points. But if you if you take the, the, the quotient as an infinity colimit, then you'll get the classifying space of that building. Yeah. So, okay. So, let me, in the last few minutes, go back to chain complexes. After all, we don't want to be dealing with spaces, we want to be dealing with uh, chain complexes. Although, we'll see that for many, uh, even when you only care about chain complexes, it's worthwhile to have this level of generality uh, to work with. Certainly, it will be. So, there's something called the dome. Uh, correspondence. Uh, there's an equivalence. So I hope people are familiar with simplicial sets. Is that a fair assumption? No. Okay. No. If it's not, 
directly summon a jack. Uh, so there's an equivalence between um, simplicial abelian groups. And uh, chain complexes. in degrees less than or equal to zero. So roughly the way it goes, so all my chain complexes are cohomological, which is why it's less than or equal to zero as opposed to so if you have a simplicial object, uh, so let's say this is roughly what it goes to is well C M you define as a minus n, and the differential is the alternating sum of the, of the simplicial face maps. So this, by very standard thing, defines that this, this, this squares to zero is the, is the observation. And so this defines a chain complex. Uh, the reason we needed the feeling groups is in order for the sum to make sense. Um, and also, this is an equivalence of categories, almost. Or rather, this can be refined to be an equivalence. <laughs> the details. So, for our purposes, th this particular functor is good enough. So. This is the formula for the different the funny sign. And I guess I guess one remark is the very first way having a very abstract way of talking about chain compact is it's useful, which is sort of silly, but in practice uh, nice, is that it allows one to not worry so much about signs all the time. And as far as I can tell, it's impossible to, for a human being to get signs right in chronological algebra. Never seen a, a treatment where that was the case, at least. <coughs> I know of no counterexample. Uh, so, so the point is, so, so what is this? So what is this funny chain complex? So what is, for instance, h zero? So h zero of max C D. So this is chain maps. Of, uh, of, of, of 
chain maps up to how much. We did something funny where we forgot the differential for a while, but the way we built in the new one, it remedied this problem. For instance, it only depends, uh, for instance, the quasi-isomorphism, up to quasi-isomorphism, this only depends on C and D up to quasi-isomorphism. Uh, so if, we, if we're serious about only caring about chain complexes up to quasi-isomorphisms, we shouldn't allow ourselves constructions that don't respect this uh, So at least on H0, we see that that's all good. Oh, and now by Del Khan, strongly people object. Uh, I very much would like to call this thing, by, both by use of notation and by, to me, very suggestive notation. Or maybe it came off. How do people feel about that notation? Is anybody, uh, all right. So, so everything by, so everything by default will be derived. <laughs> When I say k-modules are vector spaces, are, are, are you objecting? No, for some, something else. Um, I guess the derived category is the localization of all these infinity category of chain functions. No, it's, it's, well, oh, shoot.
So I apologize. I was uh, in my head thinking of the case of uh, vector spaces, which is the, the example I wanted you to have in mind for this whole thing. But if I, if I take a more general ring, that we need to make a slight modification. Just like in topological spaces, we didn't want to consider all topological spaces, but CW complexes. Here we just restrict, do the same definition, but restrict to the category of chain complexes such that at every level, um, the, uh, the module is projected. So yeah, thank you for that. Okay, so that, as, a, as you can see, is an extremely abstract definition. And so you might wonder, how in the world is it possible to ever work with such a thing? Uh, and so, well, let's see. So, first of all, <coughs> so let's try to, in the next uh, few minutes, as much as possible, get back to the usual homological algebra and see how. Um, what the usual computations in homological algebra mean from this point of view. So the first thing is that uh, there's a map. Well, there's a function. So this is the. So, this, so I so I've defined k mod to be something derived. Now I want notation for something underived, and I'm going to call it k-mod heart. For one thing, it's the heart of a t-structure. For another, it's the object we all know and love. Uh, so this is going to be the discrete category, or ordinary. There's a map from this thing to k mod. So any ordinary category you can consider as an infinity category. Just there aren't any non-identity homomorphisms. It's perfectly fine. Just like you can consider a set as a uh, topological space with a discrete topology. It's exactly analogous. And the, uh, and it takes well a k module to the thing in degree zero. Except I said projective modules here. So you have to take a projective resolution, and it sends it to that. If you take a different projective resolution, you get something equivalent uh, in a canonical way. So there is such a functor. Um, okay, so that's good. Uh, so there, so there's also there are also functors. I from K mod. There are functors in the other direction. Just taking the i homology of the complex, that of course, uh, that of course is a quasi-isomorphism invariant, so we're allowed to do that. is this notion of a fiber sequence. Fiber and co-fiber sequences. So, so, A, so, so, sorry. It's written badly, but I'll just say it in words. So A to B to C is a cofiber sequence if uh, two things are satisfied. One, the, co the composition of, oh, there's, a, there's actually an extra data, which is we have to specify a homotopy from the composite to the zero map. Uh, uh, and also that this is a pochette. So, so once we specify, if we have a map from A to B to C, together with a homotopy from uh, A to B, uh, from the composite to the zero map, this automatically.
automatically gives them gives a, a map from the pushout to C because of the because of the universal property of this of uh, the pushout, and we require that this map be an isomorphic. So this is what a cofiber sequence is, and the fiber sequence. is uh, similar to this, but uh,
in K mod. So we apply our inclusion functor and just take this map. Um, the fact that this was a kernel gives a homotopy here. And so it's a fiber sequence. So now, uh, well, instead we can take So C to D to A shifted by 1 is also a fiber sequence. Oh, so I apologize, I haven't introduced this thing. Oh boy. What's that? You yeah. have to finish. So yeah, yeah. I just. So. So there's a fiber sequence. So if you take A mapping to zero, the cofiber of that. Well, that's the definition. So I'll leave it as an exercise to check that if this is a fiber sequence, then this is a fiber sequence. Uh, and in particular, C. Uh, but because this is a sorry, this is, then this is a cofiber sequence, but this is also a fiber sequence. So C is the fiber. B mapping to A shifted by 1. In other words, any time we specify a map from B into A shifted by 1, we obtain a C uh, that we can fit in the middle here. So, extensions. So, is given by chi 0 of the mapping space from B into A of 1. The same thing as x1 oh, from B into A. I haven't screwed something up. Anyway, so I'll end here, but the, but the upshot is very easily we recover the usual uh, classification of extensions. So at least we're, we're seeing we're capturing chi x in a very natural way. So, uh, yeah, so I'll stop here next time. I'll start talking with you on So any questions? Going back to your motivation at the beginning of the talk, uh, yes. you mentioned about the expansion of the model, right? Do you know? I mentioned what? Ex uh, extended the uh, topological yes. quantity of the model, right? Yes. So do, do you know if it exists the same for a model? Can be extended a model? Yes. Oh uh, yes. So instead of quasi coherent sheaves, uh, it's it's valued in the same target category, which I didn't quite specify. But instead of quasi coherent sheaves, you, you specify the Foucault category, and it also has that. At least when the Foucault category is well defined, I guess there's a question of how well defined. Yeah, the one when it's when most defined. But but you know, assuming you believe all of Foo. Uh, then, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Say I moved in and I learned what a correct category was 15 years ago. Yes. And uh, I would have started by, by giving a bunch of axioms, um, writing something called the Octahedron. Yes. And, uh, and I would have forgotten. So I would have localized this dummy point out and then I would have kept things up to uh, the yes. but I've forgotten all this extra stuff in the one in the category business, which I can recover, but I would have forgotten about it. So I wonder if now, in circles are calling this direct category, or just triangular the category of direct category. So I wonder about this. So, 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 so I'm not sure I understood exactly what you're asking, but here's an attempt to address what you said, which is that, uh, so, I, so Given any infinity category, I forgot to mention this, there's an ordinary category that you can associate with it. So, so maps form an infinity group where you're a topological space, and you can form, take pi zero of this. This is called the homotopy category. So you see here, there was maps, a zero of maps has maps up to quite isomorphism, which, is, which exactly gives uh, the, the direct category. So instead of, by the way, instead of localizing twice in the classical construction, you could have just restricted yourself to complexes of projectives and localized once. 
Um, so, so the upshot of that is that this homotopy category of this thing that I described is the usual triangulated category, which is a direct category. Now, you asked about the octahedral axiom, and I, I don't remember exactly what it says. I remember approximately what it says. But the point of this is that you no longer need to remember what the octahedral axiom is. It's implied by, by the stability. No, but I'm just talking about like, you, you're remembering more structure than yes. people usually call the drive categories. Yes, I absolutely. wonder if now we're shifting to calling these things drive categories instead of the usual drive categories drive categories. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the okay. point of view that I'm advocating at the very least. And I think many other people accept this point of view. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank speaker. Or we continue with the lectures. Yes.